What is the goal and highest state of this world? For Marxists, the answer would be a classless society, a workers' utopia with everyone owning the means of production. For the Muslims, their goal is to place all the world under an Islamic caliphate so that all the world is under Sharia law. For other people, their goal and hope is in a secular, one world government, a sort of glorified UN. And unlike these various ungodly views and others, the gospel of Jesus Christ presents and promises the goal and highest state of the world in the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwells righteousness, with both heaven and earth united in Jesus Christ the Lord and all to the glory of the triune God when the tabernacle of God will perfectly be with men. And there's a second related question. Not merely what's the goal of all things, but how will this world end? And there are various humanistic opinions regarding this. Some think that the world will one day collide with a giant asteroid from outer space. Others say that it is more likely that mankind will be wiped out with a universal plague through killer germs or diseases. Some think, this was more popular a few decades ago, that the world will end with a nuclear holocaust through the abuse of humanity's technology. And others, thinking more long term, reckon that the world will end, as we know it, through a heat death. When the sun eventually cools to such a degree that life on earth is no longer possible for human beings. According to these secular doomsdays, the world will end with either a bang or a whimper. A bang, such as the asteroid collision or a nuclear war, or a whimper, with the universal plague eventually eliminating all of mankind, or the whimper of a heat death. But what does God's word say? And if you want one phrase that sums up what God's word says about how this world will end, that phrase would be the day of the Lord. That's the key biblical term. And that's why on the back of your bulletin, you will see the day of the Lord in the Old Testament. There are there some 24 verses in the Old Testament which mention once or twice the day of the Lord. Then you should think, here are these verses. And these verses come in a context. So the day of the Lord isn't just mentioned in these verses, but the idea of it includes verses before and after these particular texts. And if you move to the New Testament, the day of the Lord is the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ is the day of His second coming. That's the wonderful 
unity of the Old and the New Testaments, they teach the same truth. And the New Testament unfolds and develops the truth taught by the Old Testament prophets. And now what about Zephaniah, the subject of this sermon series? Well, Zephaniah uses the phrase, the day of the Lord, in six verses. Six out of the 24 verses containing the day of the Lord on the back of the bulletin are found in Zephaniah. That's a full quarter of them in this one book. And Zephaniah, you will know, consists of only three chapters. There are 929 chapters in the Old Testament. Zephaniah only contains three of them. Which means that a quarter, a full quarter of the Old Testament verses containing the phrase, the day of the Lord, are found in a book which contains only about one three hundred and tenth of the chapters in the Old Testament. That's a massively high concentration of texts dealing with this key Old Testament eschatological or end times term. And what then about our text within this book of Zephaniah? I'm referring to Zephaniah 1, verses 12 through 18. Verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. Twice, verse 14 mentions it. Verse 15 begins, that day, that is, the day of the Lord. And it makes all sorts of statements about it. That day is, it's a day of this, it's a day of that. Verse 16 continues, it's a day of the trumpet and alarm. Verse 18 uses the full phrase, neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Verse 17 is also a description of that day of the Lord, as are verses 12 and 13. All the seven verses have the one subject, the day of the Lord. So you can see what we have here in our text, beloved. We have this massive theme, the day of the Lord. And we have a huge concentration in our text on the day of the Lord. And so we're going to need two sermons on the last seven verses of Zephaniah 1. And we're going to explain their important teaching on this crucial subject of the day of the Lord, all deliberately on one Lord's day, that is today, so that this vital truth will be clearly presented to you. And by the end of this Lord's day, you will have a grasp on this big subject better than you have ever had before. So let's turn now to the great day of the Lord. A phrase which is found in verse 14. The great day of the Lord. The judgment it brings, the sin it punishes, and the God it manifests. The great day of the Lord, the judgment it brings, the sin it punishes, and the God it manifests. The day of the Lord brings both judgment and salvation as a brief consideration of the first four texts on the back of your bulletin will demonstrate. The first text, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Isaiah 2 verse 12. The day of the Lord is all about judgment there. And the context in Isaiah 2 makes that even clearer. The second and third verses on the handout, or the back of the bulletin, are both taken from Isaiah 13. Verses 6 and 9. Even a cursory glance 
will show you that they too deal with judgment. But if you were to read more on that judgment of God upon Babylon in Isaiah 13 and 14, you will see that chapter 14 verses 1 to 3 deals with the salvation of Judah through the judgment of Babylon on the day of the Lord. So there's salvation. The fourth text reads, It is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Isaiah 34 verse 8. The context here is judgment upon Edom, the day of the Lord's vengeance, and salvation for Judah because it's the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. God will save Zion by judging Edom. To repeat then, the day of the Lord brings both judgment and salvation. What then about the day of the Lord in Zephaniah 1? Is it judgment or is it salvation or is it salvation and judgment? What do these verses teach? Well, Zephaniah 1, 12 through 18, that's our text. You can look at it in your Bibles. 12 through 13, judgment. Verse 14, judgment. Verse 15, judgment. Verse 16, judgment. Verse 17, judgment. Verse 18, judgment. All judgment in our text. That's what the day of the Lord is as presented here. Let's look at our text on Sunday night, two weeks ago, Zephaniah 1, verses 7 through 11. Verse 7, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord, the key phrase again, is at hand, for the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. And it's not animals that are going to be killed here, it's ungodly human beings. Verse 10, 8 goes on to say, It shall come to pass in the day of the Lord, the phrase again, the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish. Verse 9 uses the same word, visit, that is, in this context, punish. And verses 10 and 11 describe the day of the Lord as being filled with the sound of people howling. Verses 7 through 11, again, are all filled with judgment. And then we have our text on Sunday morning, two weeks ago, Zephaniah 1, verses 1 through 6. We can set aside verse 1 for the present purposes because that contains the heading, and so it doesn't count. But verses 2 and 3, from which we got the heading of that sermon on these verses, deals with the utter consumption of all things. And verses 4, 5, and 6 speak of God's cutting off five groups of sinful people. It's all judgment again. In Zephaniah 1, it's all judgment without a single reference to salvation. In all three of the sections, the first six verses, then verses 7, through 11, and in our text, verses 12 through 18, all 17 verses, apart from the heading, which doesn't count, because Zephaniah 1 isn't speaking of the elect remnant for whom the day of the Lord is salvation. Zephaniah 1 deals with the reprobate wicked for whom the day of the Lord is judgment. Indeed, if you were to look at the whole of the sheet, the back of the bulletin, and all the verses there, and all the verses in their context, and not just the first four to which I referred earlier, you would see that the Old Testament references to the day of the Lord are mostly <coughs> about judgment. And there are only a few references to salvation such as those I mentioned earlier in Isaiah 
14, 1 through 3, and 34, verse 8. So Zephaniah 1 isn't all that unusual in dealing with judgment. But in that it deals with judgment verse after verse after verse for a whole chapter. It's a very strong emphasis on that side of the day of the Lord. So let's look now specifically at the judgments in our text. The day of the Lord, verse 13, what does it mean? Their goods shall become a booty or plunder or spoil of war and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. In this verse, the day of the Lord means loss. Nothing but loss. You lose your possessions. You lose your house. You lose your vineyards and your wine. And on the great coming day of the Lord, which is future to us, All of the wicked will lose absolutely everything. They will lose all their money. They will lose all their property. And they will lose all the good things that they had for a while in God's providence. And which they pressed into the service of sin. Because everything will be burned up with fire. 2 Peter 3. Verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice or noise of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. So what then is the characteristic voice or noise of the day of the Lord? Well, our text doesn't deal with that voice or noise from the divine or heavenly perspective, then it would be the trumpet of the Lord or the voice of the archangel or the divine shout. But the voice or noise spoken of in our text is from the human and earthly perspective. What will you hear on that day? Human lamentation. People crying, that is, shouting out. People crying Bitterly, even the strong soldiers and warriors, they will cry out. Men who naturally possess more of human courage than the rest of us. Men who are specifically trained to cope with terrible things. Men who have seen destruction many times before. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. All his training and natural courage will not avail him one whit. He's going to be terrified. This is exactly what happens to the wicked at the day of our Lord's return. Revelation 1 verse 7 states, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. This howling is of course a prelude to the everlasting weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth by the wicked in the lake of fire. That's why all men are called to repent and believe in Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Verse 17 describes the day of the Lord in terms of distress and agony. When men, as it were, walk around like blind men in their confusion, It's a day of terrible slaughter. Their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Human beings, with respect to their bodies and their blood, will be on that day common and worthless, like dust. 
or done. They are just thrown out as so much rubbish. Because this is what sin does to men and women and children in God's judgment. Fulfilling the purpose of honouring God and serving Him and enjoying life? No. Blood poured out like dust. Flesh jettisoned as dung. Verse 18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. No deliverance can be bought with money. No deliverance can be found in idols, which were and are often made of silver and gold. So in the day of the Lord's judgment, there's no point relying on your wealth or on any pagan religions or upon yourself and your achievements. Nothing can deliver in that day. The penultimate book of the Bible, the book of Jude, teaches the same truth as Zephaniah 1. It refers to the judgment of the great day. Another way of speaking of the day of the Lord, the great day, the judgment of the great day. That's verse 6. Behold, the Lord cometh with thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince or convict all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude 14 and 15. So that deliverance and safety is found only in the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. We must trust in him alone. So what sins? What sins are especially mentioned as being punished at or on the day of the Lord according to the text on the back of the ball? The very head of the page, the sin that is singled out, is pride. Isaiah 2 verse 12. The day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. When every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Ezekiel 13 verse 5 in its context says the day of the Lord will come upon the false prophets for their false prophecy. That's what it will mean for the false church which smooths the edges of God's word and corrupts the scriptures to find the pleasure of the world. A significant number of the texts on the back of the page that deal with the day of the Lord in the Old Testament deal with the sin of persecuting God's people. That's the background in Isaiah 34 mentioned earlier. Edom oppressed God's people. Therefore the day of the Lord is upon them to judge them. In Obadiah 15 and the context, Babylon comes in and destroys Jerusalem. Edom eggs them on, helps them, laughs at Israel, rejoices in their defeat. And the day of the Lord will come upon them for that sin of persecuting God's saints. In Joel chapter 3, the day of the Lord is judgment upon the Gentiles who sold God's people as slaves. In Zechariah 14, it's the ungodly nations who attack the church who experience the day of the Lord that destroys them. With that background... And the question is, well, what specific sin is highlighted in our text as that which is punished at the day of the Lord? And we say, well, it's not any of the three that I just mentioned that occur on the back of the bulletin. It's not pride as such. It's not false prophecy 
as such. It's not persecuting God's people. In our text, the sin that is highlighted is the sin of denying God's providence. The day of the Lord will come, and here it will especially target those who deny God's providential government of the earth. Now you wouldn't have mentioned that, you wouldn't have thought of that, you wouldn't have written that. But the Spirit does, because he has a different perspective from weak, frail men. At the end of verse 12, we're told that God comes to punish those who say, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. When you hear that word and you think about it, you say to yourself, you know what, that's, that's very like the thinking of our world today. This is, in biblical Old Testament language, a description of the secularizing spirit of our age. We don't have to be thankful to God because the good things don't come from Him. And the evil or unpleasant things don't come from Him either because the world hates that idea that God could be punishing it for its sins. So tsunamis and terrorist attacks have nothing to do with the providence of God. Their belief is that Jehovah is not actively involved in our world at all. He doesn't govern anything. He doesn't order anything. He doesn't judge on the earth. All we ever hear when terrible things happen is about man. Man maybe did this. Or Mother Nature did this. Or chance. Or it just happened. And our text is saying this is the mind of God and Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a serial killer. You don't have to be a rapist to feel the terrible judgment of God on the day of the Lord. Just that way of thinking, the Lord, he doesn't really do any good. He doesn't really do any evil either. Just that way of thinking is enough all by itself though there are many, many other sins that God judges, but this is the one mentioned here, that way of thinking, all by itself, is to warrant the judgment of God on the day of the Lord to destroy you. And you might think in yourself, and you would certainly think, well, there are other people who are going to think, well, that isn't enough. Sure, that's no big deal. And I say, QED. If you think that that's no big problem to deny that God rules in heaven and earth, then you are wicked. That is sheer unbelief. And you might say, well, I'm so secular in my thinking that I don't think that that's any big deal. Standing on my neighbor's toe is a big problem, but who cares about God? You say, well, you're going to have to say that to him face to face. And that's the attitude that he hates and for which he will destroy you in the day of Jesus Christ. More particularly, the text says that God will punish on the day of the Lord those who deny his providence in the visible institute church, not just the world. Verse 12 says, I will search Jerusalem, not Babylon or Tyre or Zidon. I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their knees Say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. And so the day of the Lord falls in crushing judgment upon those who are careless, those who are indifferent, those who are carnally secure in the church, the men who are settled on their lees. This is an image taken from the world of wine. The sediment falls to the bottom of the barrel over time if it isn't periodically shaken or disturbed. And there are people in the church who say, well, no matter what the Bible says, or no matter what the minister says, or no matter what I hear in catechism, no, God doesn't really do anything on the earth. He doesn't really bless his people. 
He doesn't really punish people in this world or in the next. God says the day of the Lord as a day of judgment is specifically for you to think that way. Because you will notice that verse 12 deals with people in the visible instituted church that say this in their heart. I will search Jerusalem and punish those that say in their heart the Lord will not do good neither will he do evil. So you don't even have to say this out loud. You don't even have to spread this unbelief in the congregation. It is simply enough for your judgment and destruction on the day of the Lord for you to think it. You don't want the unbelieving world to know what you really think, so you simply think it and don't say it. You don't want the people in the church to know what you really think, so you keep it in your heart. You don't want the office bearers to know what you really think, so you don't utter it out loud. But God knows the wicked, unbelieving thoughts of men, including hypocrites in the church, who deny his providence, who deny his active involvement in the world. That is, because let's cut to the quick, that is, to deny his deity. Because if you deny that God is active in the world, blessing or cursing, sending pleasant and good things, and sending unpleasant and nasty things, you, to all intents and purposes, deny the living and the true God. Any God who does not govern all that happens on the earth isn't really God at all. And you can keep the word and maybe even speak him or speak about him, but if you don't believe his active involvement in the world every moment, according to his eternal counsel, what you have isn't God at all. It's just a word. And so God says, I will search Jerusalem with candles or lamps. I will peer into every street and every house in the church. I will search every heart of every member of the congregation with my candle or lamp going into the dark recesses of the human mind and I will know perfectly and exactly who in their heart of hearts thinks this way and I will ferret every man, woman and child out. So the distinctive perspective of our text in Zephaniah 1 is that the day of the Lord deals with this sin, the denial of God's real providence amongst those who think it in the visible instituted church. We have to deal with a fearful God and we need his mercy in Jesus Christ otherwise we perish. <coughs> Otherwise, the day of the Lord is for our judgment, not our salvation. So who is the God who is manifested on the day of the Lord, according to our text at the end of Zephaniah 1? The first and most obvious thing is that the God who is manifest on the day of the Lord is the one who does the things that are expressly denied to him by unbelievers in the visible church. The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. That's what they're saying in their hearts. And our text says, God is the God who does. God has a special day for coming and doing evil, not in the sense of doing sinful, but doing evil in the sense of unpleasant, painful, terrible things that are experienced as evil by men. God won't do anything. It's okay. 
Keep going on the way you're going. God will come and you will lose all your property and all your possessions and he will make even the mightiest men cry bitterly. And then you can say to yourself, oh, the Lord, the Lord isn't going to do evil. Yeah, yeah, but he is. Verse 17 states, I will bring distress upon men. I will do it. God did it. Did exactly what Zephaniah said he would do by the Spirit. God did it in 587 or 586 BC with the fall of Jerusalem in the past. And God will do it at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the future. Because the day of the Lord, pictured in Zephaniah 1 and many other places in the Old Testament, when it refers to a concrete Old Testament event, is only a picture of the great and grand universal day of the Lord in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. But in his sending judgment, that is good. The day of the Lord is God doing good. Because it glorifies God. Because it saves his elect church redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ. The God manifested by the day of the Lord is the God who does all the things that are denied him. And the ungodly hearts of unbelievers in the church. The God who is manifested in the day of the Lord's second is Jehovah. The standard phrase is the day of the Lord, with the word Lord in our authorized version, capitalized. That is, it's a reference to Jehovah. It's a reference to the true God over against all idols, visible or invisible. The God who said to Moses, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament church, I am that I am, the self-existent God, the eternal God, the unchangeable God, the faithful God, the God who keeps covenant with his people to a thousand generations. And thirdly, in our text, the day of the Lord especially manifests one aspect of Jehovah namely his wrath verse 15 begins that day the day of the Lord is a day of wrath verse 18 begins neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath God's wrath is not an evil petulance which is native to sinful fallen human beings with their anger, wrath. But God's wrath, being God's wrath, is a holy and righteous aversion and punishment of the wicked for their sins. The truth of God's wrath is cordially hated by many. The world denies and mocks it as some remnant of medievalism. Shows how much they know. And the false church avoids the truth of the wrath of God, ignores and undermines it because it proclaims as loudly as it can that God loves everybody and wants to save everybody. And so really, there can't be any wrath at all. When we talk about the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord being a day of wrath, we're not teaching something medieval. We're teaching something biblical. And we're not teaching something that is merely Old Testament as if the Old Testament wasn't the word of God also. But here we have it in Revelation 6. This is the cry of all the ungodly on the day of Christ. Fall on us 
and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Two references to wrath and it's the wrath of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ and the great day of his wrath. It's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ and his wrath. And on the great coming day of the Lord. At the end of the age. God will be manifest. In Jesus Christ. Remember who he is. He's the incarnate son of God. The second person of the Holy Trinity. Born of the Virgin Mary. Fully man. And now glorified. He is the revelation of the triune God. He is the image of God. He is the face of God. And so Jesus said to his disciples and to all his people now. He who has seen me. Has seen the father. And on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God will come bodily, visibly, gloriously with his holy angels in the brightness of the glory of God. And so Jehovah will be manifest in Jesus Christ for the first time openly and publicly, incontrovertibly and undeniably. It's the day of the Lord. The Lord alone will be seen and magnified in that day, not man. This is why the Bible speaks of the coming of Christ and of God, the appearing of Christ and of God, the revelation of Christ and of God, the manifestation of Christ and of God on the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord Jesus. Those who are outside of Jesus Christ need to see God manifest in the cross before they see God manifest in Christ's coming. They must believe in the satisfaction of God's wrath upon the Lamb at Calvary or they will experience the wrath of the Lamb. You must turn to him and trust in him. Because you are not ready for the day of the Lord and the next life unless you already know a day of repentance, a day of faith, and a day of salvation in this life. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy clear revelation to us of the day of the Lord. Teach us to fear thee. For the fear of thee is the beginning of knowledge. And may we trust in Jesus and be ready for that great and dreadful day. Increase and give us faith. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.